This is Audible. Historical Rhetorical presents Father of His Country. This book is the biography of George Washington. It is written by John Harrington and is told in poetic verse. Page one, patriotic civic mission. Patriotism I shall proclaim, and loyalty will be my game. To my colonists I will give my all, because civic duty is to be my call. For my country I will always fight by keeping the enemies in sight. Serving as a soldier I will be brave, even though I would fight to my grave. As politician on laws I will vote, and sometimes make a famous quote. Also to my family I will be true. Now let's read on. Without further ado, page two, welcoming timely arrival, February twenty second, seventeen thirty two. With very much acclaim, I come to be, as my eager mother announces me, named Wakefield. My birth house, so sleek, lies in Virginia, right at Pope's Creek, in Westmoreland County. I now reside, along the Rappahannock River's tide. Here in Virginia, all is merry, living on my farm named Ferry. Cows, pigs, and chickens we raise, very fortunately with high praise. Growing our crops, life is grand, on this very fertile, rich farmland. Page three, loving supportive family. Tobacco, my father Augustine grows. Regardless of sales highs and lows, most often our relationship is grand, although he leads with a guiding hand. At times when push almost comes to shove, my mother Mary caresses me with love. To me, she is always very sincere, even when she'll block my naval career. Samuel, Charles, and John, my love smothers. Also Lawrence and Austin. My brothers, often tricking me though never sinister, Elizabeth, my one and only sister. Page four, colonial childhood hobbies. Amongst family and friends, I play with marbles, tops, and balls all day. Flying kites and fishing—it's so fun. Also hiding and seeking under the sun. Having barbecues, we all cheer. Having barbecues, we all cheer, at a much celebrated county fair. Attending an outing, it's so nice, and is definitely worth the price. On my pony, I gallop so fast, because riding it is such a blast. They are convenient, useful, and agile, for having one is definitely in style. Page five, neighborhood elementary school. To a local neighborhood school I go, which I walk to even in rain and snow. In this wooden building, all is well, as we start at the ringing of a bell. Our tiny class, Master Hobby teaches, and often lectures us with preaches. Though mostly fair, he is so stern. But right now, learning's my turn. Reading, writing, and math I study with a very smart classroom buddy. Learning new things it makes me smart, for this knowledge is a very good start. Page six, formal civil rules, a code of conduct I will use to be performed on many cues. Sets of rules one hundred and ten are practiced by ladies and men. Personal hygiene they must perform, also etiquette, which is the norm. When doing this, I won't be tense, for good manners are common sense. By the age of sixteen, I must learn, because it will be of my concern. Our rules of civility, practiced and urgent, must be taken seriously, one hundred percent. Page seven, 
Sixteen-year-old surveyor, 1748. Chains, ropes, and stakes I purvey to measure the land for a survey. Marking boundaries, it's so dire that farmers call me for hire. To size a frontier, Lord Fairfax asks, and I agree as one of my biggest tasks. Working colleagues, a total of three, ask him for only a very modest fee. My fine performance, customers praise, so my vocation will see more days. Losing interest, although well paid, I shall pursue another fine trade. Page eight, Mount Vernon inheritance. At church, many people are massing, for my half brother Lawrence is passing. Because he died of smallpox, I am sad. Just as much as when gout took my dad, Mount Vernon I shall inherit, and may I say with great merit, with maintenance it stays clean, yet always stays fit for a queen. After my passing, the public will see many nice things that belonged to me. It will become a museum, very well known, though it will be other people's own. Page nine, Virginia militia enlistment, February tenth, seventeen fifty three. In the Virginian militia I enlist, so I can defend my every colonist. To my government I will stay loyal, by guaranteeing my very best toil. Proudly as a soldier I now serve, because the militia is my verve. When I was recommended, I was glad, and I promise you this isn't a fad. Virginia Governor Robert Dinwiddie, I think, for making me a major, which is a very high rank. The troops I'm training, unskilled and new, always respectfully see my point of view. Page ten, French and Indian War, seventeen fifty-three. From Canada, the French soldiers hunt for animal furs for money on our front. I march my militia, two hundred manned. And ask them politely to leave our land. While being dined, a letter I show to Captain Legardier at Fort Le Beau. Not obeying it, showing no discreet, he wins, and I suffer my first defeat. At Fort Necessity, I once again fail against French commander Coulin's assail. Helping us fight this war, the world's best, is England's army to help us win the rest. Page eleven, sacred vowed matrimony, January sixth, seventeen fifty nine. Martha Dandridge Cutis I did meet, with a gentleman's courteous greet. I proposed to her, thinking much less, but to my delight she says yes. To our great honor, we now do be wed at her parents' white house homestead. My new beautiful bride, dressed in yellow. Makes me the world's luckiest fellow. My stepkids Jack and Patsy I help raise, through thick and thin at every phase. Being married to Martha, it is so great, for she will always be my lifelong mate. Page twelve, Unfair Stamp Act, seventeen sixty-five. A tax on legal documents we pay, also for permits without any say. Having a toll on newspapers, it's hard, even for pamphlets and a playing card. A declaration the Stamp Act Congress draws, of rights and grievances with a clause. These twenty-seven delegates from nine colonies so upset, think we should not pay for England's war debt. The Stamp Act, their Parliament finally repeals, which gives we colonists back our true ideals. When merchants were taxed, tempers were hot. But now there's no British merchandise boycott. Page thirteen, First Continental Congress, September fifth through October twenty sixth, seventeen seventy four. Fifty five congressmen I am proudly meeting at Carpenter's Hall with a warm greeting. Here in Philadelphia, PA, it's very vital that all representatives speak their recital. Many items England does unfairly tax, 
and commits many more intolerable acts. Having many restrictions, it is not fair. So we are discussing these problems here. Many differences our dispute involves, so we write a declaration of resolves. Printing this record, we all work fast, because both sides must agree at last. Page 14. Lexington and Concord, Massachusetts Battle, April 19th, 1775. The regulars are coming out. Colonists here is alarmed by William Dawes and Paul Revere. Hundreds of England's soldiers in coats of red come to seize our weapons hidden in a shed. Into Lexington the redcoats march over the North Bridge's wooden arch. Our Minutemen soldiers, very tense, outnumber them for a better defense. The first bullet, no one knows which side hurled, is known as the shot heard round the world. As our Captain Parker wins, the battle is done. So England's Major Pitcairn's army makes a run. Page 15, Second Continental Congress, May 10th, 1775 through March 1st, 1781. To our dispute, England doesn't agree, as King George III won't read our plea. They take our rights more and more, so we finance our revolutionary war. This important event we don't pause, for we also find allies to join our cause. Benjamin Franklin, so smart but staid, is now in Paris, France, for military aid. Me as commander-in-chief, Congress does select, of the Continental Army from a military intellect. My army will carry on, although low supplied, but I will always provide for them as their guide. Page 16, Bunker Hill, Massachusetts Battle, June 17, 1775. From England to Boston, the Redcoats sail, with their many warship on a very large scale. Please fortify, our General Putman says now, so we can defeat their general, William Howe. On both sides the iron cannonballs roar, as this battle starts by the seashore. The redcoats make charges, a total of three, but always fail and board their ships at sea. With our guns low on ammo, slow to rattle, the redcoats starve, so we win this battle. Months in a truce, numbering nine, the British sail to Nova Scotia for an outline. Page 17. Significant Northern Battles. December 30th, 1775 to October 17th, 1777. Quebec, Canada, our General Montgomery invades, with Benedict Arnold assisting the raids. The French and British army, very elite, forces our army to make a hasty retreat. As Arnold is running, the British gain, then conquers his army on Lake Champlain. Our fort Ticonderoga, weak and slender, is seized, so Benedict calls for a surrender. With a win, our General Stark does flaunt, after the Battle of Bennington, Vermont. After winds at Oriskany and Saratoga were strong. Also twice at Freeman's Farm we sing a song. Page 18. American Independence Declaration. July 4th, 1776. A document, James Madison edits, with all the crucial pieces and bits. To finish this contract, it is so dire, for its most Americans deep desire. This five-part certificate, fifty-six men sign, on their own imaginary dotted line. Written in a short time, proper and real, this Declaration of Independence is our seal. Our country, we colonists now finally own, without ruling from a king's throne. From England we will always be free, and celebrate Independence Day with glee. Page 19, Long Island, New York Battle, August 27th, 1776. To win this big conflict, I do vow, 
by defeating British General Howe. At this largest battle, I do my best, because this clash is my biggest test. With twenty-two thousand soldiers, they give chase to our only thirteen thousand, which is disgrace. In Brooklyn Heights, our might is thin, also at Manhattan, giving them a win. Losing this battle, we cleverly flee up the Hudson River to Fort Lee. That they follow us, it is so intense. But in New Jersey, we put up a defense. Page 20 Trenton and Princeton, New Jersey Battles December 26th, 1776 and January 3rd, 1777 Marching from Fort Lee, I am bossing while we make a Delaware River crossing. Rowing on Christmas night, it's not nice, because we freeze and dodge all this ice. In a surprise attack, the Hessians fall, with the loss of their leader, Colonel Rall. For our soldiers, morale is so high that more people give our army a try. At Princeton, the British angrily grin as we cheer again with another win. After this crush, the Hessians are done, so General Cornwallis's army makes a run. Page 21, Valley Forge, Pennsylvania Retreat December 19th, 1777 to June 19th, 1778 Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, General Howe captures, which evacuates many of our political figures. By seizing Germantown, he is more grand. Also, Brandywine clinches him in this Pennsylvania stand. As we starve, there is little food to gorge. So many succumb here at Valley Forge. Our spirits and the weather, raw and cold, brings my soldiers' confidence to a hold. With much more food, we seldom cry, for General Green now manages our supply. Aptly, Baron von Steuben trains us more, so we now have a much better army corps. Page 22. Notable Southern Battles. May 12th, 1780 to September 8th, 1781. Losing at Charleston and Camden, it stings. Also Habricks Hill, 96 and Utah Springs. With these upsets, our future looks bleak for they also win us at Waxhawks Creek. Using their military might, the British douse, as our green loses at Guilford Courthouse. Fortunately, Cornwallis's winds are pyrrhic, and our fewer fatalities does the trick. Our winds at Cowpens we gladly fulfill, also King's Mountain and Ramsewer's Mill. Of the southern battles, they won more, although we're still strong fighting this war. Page 23. British Surrender at Yorktown, Virginia. October 19th, 1781. Marching into Virginia, the British quiver, because my army confronts them by the York River. Knowing they're outnumbered, they turn gray, while the French Navy blocks the Chesapeake Bay. Very scared and surrounded, the British quit for French General Rochambeau helps us quite a bit. As they march, the world turned upside down. They play as Cornwallis surrenders at Yorktown. With the ceremony, the war dramatically ends. But soon America and England will be friends. As they lose 10,000 soldiers, 25,000 of us are lost, bringing our freedom from England to a high cost. Page 24. Peace Treaty Signing September 3rd, 1783. Sailing the Atlantic Ocean, our reps advance to the Western European country of France. Now in its capital, very large and bright, they're meeting in Paris, the City of Light. Our Treaty of Paris, the French display, is autographed by John Adams and John Jay. As Benjamin Franklin pens, it becomes legit. For England's David Hodgley also signs it. The United States we now possess, after all this political mess. From England we are legally free, so its citizens now hold the key. 
Page 25. Important Constitutional Convention. May 25th to September 17th, 1787. Me as president of this meeting, they elect to help write our constitution, a big project. Reps from 12 states, a total of 55, come to debate their opinions with a strive. A federal government we Congress now create to politically manage and unite every state. We'll have a monetary system, fair and content, and a tax structure with political consent. Our new federal laws Congress shall make, which the President will enforce for our sake. When there are legal disputes, cold and raw, judges will hear cases and interpret the law. Page 26. Citizens' Rights Bill. Ratified December 15th, 1791. His very own proposal, James Madison recites, is a document named Bill of Rights. Amendments of the Constitution, the first ten, guarantees liberties to every American citizen. Freedom of choice, speech, and religion we choose. Also to possess weapons, which is good news. Lodging soldiers and illegal searches, now banned, and jailing the innocent is unlawful in our land. A speedy but fair trial defendants can face, plus a jury for at least a $20 case. We have sensible punishment, never cruel, also rights and state laws. That's the rule. Page 27. First American President. April 30th, 1789 to March 4th, 1797. Our new federal government, I now preside, by receiving all 69 electoral votes in a landslide. Winning the second vote, totaling 34, is Vice President John Adams, who is my mentor. To administer the department, I nominate Thomas Jefferson for Secretary of State, Alexander Hamilton as Treasurer, I am sure, and Henry Knox to head the Department of War. With very much delight, I am pleased to say, our Chief Justice is the Honorable John Jay. Samuel Osgood is our Postmaster, also Federal, while Edwin Randolph is our Attorney General. Page 28. Primary Presidential Accomplishments At the Capitol, we politicians must dwell, in Philadelphia, near the Liberty Bell. The Fugitive Slave Act, plain and clear, allows masters to recover them without fear. The Judiciary Act, I hope establish and sort, is the creation of our state and federal court. Native Americans have commerce free and lax, and privacy with the Indian Intercourse Acts. For establishing our Navy, there's me to thank, also for the Mint and the First National Bank. To be a citizen, you must be male, adult, and white, for the Naturalization Act gives you that right. Page 29. Newly Established Army. July 2nd, 1798. A third four-year presidential term I turned down, for some wanted me to be a king and wear a crown. My presidency is over. Although it's been great, so I ride my horse back home on my private estate. Our new United States Army I now train, for President John Adams asks for this campaign. I choose Alexander Hamilton, able and literal, this former treasurer for my inspector general. A $50,000 bribe to France we pay to send our delegates back safely on their way. Because of this theft, we may fight the French, but luckily we don't have to with a clench. Page 30. Well-deserved retirement, 1798. From public life, I definitely now retire, for being home alone with Martha is my desire. 
Back here on my plantation, peaceful and calm, I feel like I have the whole world in my palm. While things get busy, there's no time to waste, so I write my will and do my chores with haste. I'm building a horse barn, French styled and new, as I welcome Bushrod Washington, my nephew. As I start to flower business, more people visit, though at times it bothers me quite a bit. Lodging all my guests, expensive and loud, I almost go bankrupt taking care of this crowd. Page 31 Untimely Mnemonic Passing December 14th, 1799 Working on chores outside, I shall complete Through all of this miserable snow and sleet Covered in freezing rain, cold and wet I finally go inside, thinking it's no threat A cold leading to pneumonia, I suddenly catch For my old age and bad weather is no match This disease of the lung, very widespread Confines me so far to two days in my bed. By my bedside, my wife Martha does stay, for we both know this is my final day. Dr. James Craig fails to cure me, although wise, so I utter, tis well, and meet my demise. Page 32 Unforgettable, Everlasting Legacy my mission I did successfully complete, through perseverance, without conceit. At all times I stayed very loyal, even when my temper came to a boil. The U.S. Capitol, after me they'll name, also monument and statues because of my fame. U.S. Navy ships, a minimum of three, and a large state will be named after me. About my life, people will hear. As time goes by, year after year, to my country, I always stayed true by fighting for freedom for me and you. This has been Historical Rhetorical, Father of His Country, written by John Harrington and narrated by Gabriel Reyes. Copyright 2016 by John Harrington. Production copyright by John Harrington.